Hello, good to have you with us. Welcome to the North Downey Church of Christ. I am David Moorhead, and um, we are still on lockdown, I guess. You know, we, we, we just learned very recently that now the um, hair salons and the barbers are now able to cut hair, and the nail salons as well. I wonder if that had anything to do with Nancy Pelosi. I don't know for sure. But we are going to do that. And so if you have your hairs out of whack or something, you can get your hair cut. But for some reason, you still can't come to church and worship. So this is, uh, you know, who knows? That day may come very soon. But in the meantime, we have this opportunity to worship the Lord, to study God's word. And of course, we want to encourage you. Uh, we have our Sunday morning worship too that, that comes up and we, we video that. So for a number of you who are watching, and as I've always said, uh, it's probably a good idea if you have friends or neighbors or somebody you'd like to, you know, that maybe you can't get them in the church building, but uh, maybe you'd like to bring them to your house and, and watch it. Or maybe just tell them how to tune into this and watch this video. It could be very helpful. It could be a nice little ministry. Uh, in the meantime, here we are. We're, we're studying the book of Acts, and we're glad to have you with us today. Of course, we have a number of people we want to keep in our prayers. We know that uh, Joe, we want to keep him in our prayers, and LaFanya, uh, that, that's, she's apparently she's going to go through some tests next week and keep her in our prayers. And um, who else? Mary's dad in our prayers, and Mary herself, and uh, your son. And my son Daniel, keep him in our, in our prayers. Both. Oh, both my sons. That's right. Both my sons, keep them in our prayers. That's a whole another story. Don't ask. <laughs> but, it's, uh, but we have them out there. And uh, I also want to bring up the fact that besides, you know, of course, all the, the crazy, the chaos in the communities and everything, I want to keep in our prayers and in mind uh, um, the many police officers out there who have been attacked. Um, I, I just did a quick check today of how many police officers have died this year. 117 police officers across the country have been killed uh, in the line of duty. And that's just a, it's a terrible thing. We, and we have police officers who are getting discouraged. We have uh, people who have said the most awful things to them. And uh, no matter what you do, as the president himself had mentioned, that uh, they have to be very careful in certain situations, and within a fraction of a second, they can either, you know, uh, do something good or in, in a matter of violence or kill someone and then get in trouble. And so there are many police officers who are leaving the area, leaving the forces, or getting discouraged, getting depressed. So we need to keep them in our prayers. And I would encourage you, if you ever see a police officer or a sheriff's deputy or something like that, tell them, uh, tell them thank you. I'm not sure if you can shake their hands, but, but wave at them uh, and uh, say hello to them. And just, uh, I'm not sure if you can give them a box of donuts either, but <laughs> if you can, or or some people I know, there's one person I know who does, who, if you, they're at a restaurant, will buy them dinner. But I hope they don't see that as a bribe. <laughs> say it's not a bribe, right? But it would be a good thing to do that. Now, just last week, we had this uh, St. Louis police officer who was shot to death. Um, and he was, he's a father of three children, I believe, and very sad to see that. And then if you watch the Republican convention, you had the heartbreaking testimony of the wife of, I think his name is David Dorn. He was a retired um, sergeant or captain. I can't remember what he was with the St. Louis Police Department. He was shot in cold blood while it was being live streamed. And this is his poor wife giving this testimony. So um, lots of difficult things going on there. So let's keep them in our prayers and, uh, you know, look for the best and see what, how the Lord will, will bless us and, and bless, pray for our country, our president, the nation, all the other. We have a big prayer list. Okay, so, so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll begin with our, our study in the book of Acts. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we are very, very thankful to you, God, for the wonderful blessings that you give to us and this opportunity, God, the video opportunity to to uh, share your word, to study it together. And uh, we know not only our own members are able to watch this and, and share with us and reading their Bibles and study and so forth. We know that there are many people out there that we have not met 
Uh, there are people in different states and different cities who check in, and we, we honor you, God. We thank you, God, for that opportunity to spread the gospel that way. And we pray that, the, that you will bless us, bless the activity of your word. And God, we do pray also for uh, <coughs> <pardon me. clears throat> the many concerns that we brought up, the, the people who are ill, people who are going through some difficult times in their life. We think of Joe in the facility over there. We just discussed the fact that we, we cannot personally give him things because uh, they, they're very worried about um, the infection that may spread there because of the COVID-19. So we pray for him, pray for his well-being, and I understand that he's able to watch these uh, video things. So Joe, um, we pray for him, bless his heart, and bless him, Father, for continued uh, good health. And then we pray for Lafania, who is um, about to go, undergo more tests and, and then uh, some, uh, I believe, chemotherapy. So we'll pray for her and pray we pray, God, that uh, the chemotherapy will be effective in the way that uh, it will stop any spread of any disease and that she can be healed. And of course, we do not rule out nor want to prevent you, God, from healing her and bringing healing to her body. And so, and uh, we encourage you, uh, we encourage her, Father. We pray for her, her strength of, um, of spirit as well as her body. And we pray for Robert as he's helping her through this difficult time, God. Many other people that we can think of uh, in our friendship and neighborhood. We think, of course, of, of Mary and her father and mother and, and uh, kind of the challenges that, that her father is going through, the physical challenges and such. And we pray for Mary as she kind of helps in the family and, and kind of endures her, her own frustrations. But I'm glad she's here. And we're glad, Father, you've, you've led her to us. And uh, she's, she's your child. Uh, we pray for my sons, pray God that you bless them and lead them to the truth and, and help them to in their, uh, help them to get better, God. We just pray for that and it's so necessary. And then finally, God, we, we think not only about the state of our nation, which is um, in, really in a mess and, and our, our, this election year that seems to be worse than any other election year we've had with <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> with so many bad things that are going on, the, the words that are being shared, the lies that are being shared and all of this. Uh, but we also think of our police officers out there who are um, working hard. Many of them are working double shifts over time, especially we think of the police in places like Portland and Seattle and other places where they've had to work long hours and get attacked and uh, people throwing bricks at them and shooting at them and such. And we just pray God that you bless them with uh, help at this time and guide them and guide guide them to safety. And God, we pray for your blessings on our time together, blessings on this study. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. My throat was going dry, but anything could happen. Hey, I want to say share this with you. I hope you, you are looking at the bulletin. Uh, we are sending them out. My wife is the editor, so I can say good things about it, right? She does a good job, my wife. And so uh, and it's called The Reporter. And so we have two pages of it, of course, and it has all the uh, updates on the prayer list and certain stories and, of course, nice write-ups that she has in the back. Yes, oh, put it like that. That's right. That's how it looks. This is high tech. <laughs> and this is how it looks. So if you do get it, read it. You know, take some time to read it. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, Judy does a, a good job. It always has the names of the... Of the um, sermons and the studies and things that are going on out there. <clears throat> now, to lighten things up before we get into it. Um, no, wrong one. <laughs> These are our jokes. This is my jokes. Okay, so some of the jokes aren't very good. Oh, here's one. Uh, why did the woman leave her purse open when she went outside? Well, the answer is she expected some change in the weather. Okay. How can a room full of people be empty? Well, if everyone in the room is married, there isn't a single person in there. <laughs> You'll think about these things on the way home. Okay. Uh, oh, no, there's no, you're not driving home, are you? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> oh, yeah. It's kind of a lengthy one. A cross-country hiker was invited to supper by some hillbillies. You already know where this is going, right? Uh, stepping around the washing machine that was on the lawn and the two 
uh, and two hound dogs on the porch, the hiker went into the kitchen. When he sat down to eat with the family, he noticed that the dishes were among the dirtiest he had ever seen. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, excuse me, he said. But uh, were these dishes washed? He asked warily. And the person said, they're as clean as soap and water can get them, replied the woman of the house. Satisfied with that response, the hiker scooped food into his plate and enjoyed every morsel. When the dinner was over, the hillbilly husband tossed the dishes onto the porch and called to the hounds, okay, soap, okay, water, wow. come and get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> Stay tuned for more next week, right? So, okay. <clears throat> All right, today we are in Acts uh, chapter 9. Great uh, book of uh, you know, adventure, Acts chapter 9. Last week we, we spoke about the conversion of the uh, Paul, or who was Saul, and of course his name will eventually be named to be changed to Paul. Um, he was Saul of Tarsus, right? And you recall, very famous, well-known section, of course, after he was uh, giving hearty encouragement to the death and killing of, of Stephen. And then from there, he got into this thing about wanting to hunt down every possible Christian he could. Uh, as, as we read earlier, he would go into places where he would try to you know, bring uh, families into jail and uh, one, he was breathing murderous threats to these people. So he was really strong on this. Now, he wasn't a thug or anything like this. He wasn't a, a, a person who you might we think is a, you know, empty-headed, you know, just an ignorant person. He was very smart. Uh, he was highly educated. But he, was, he became basically a terrorist because he, he felt that Judaism, what he grew up in, was being threatened by these by these Christians. So he had spent his lifetime studying the Old Testament, studying all the scriptures and everything, and he he was on the defensive, and he decided to go out there, be proactive, and uh, get every one of these people who were obliterating his religion. That's what he thought. He was sincere in heart and all of this. And uh, so he's on his way to Damascus, as you know. And we've read through that where... <coughs> <clears throat> and he has these men with him, and he gets up to that place where um, he's struck down. And, um, and then he hears his voice, says, uh, in verse 4 of chapter 9 of Acts, says, uh, he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So in other words, he's, he's like kind of fighting history, that idea of, uh, the goads were basically saying, you're being spurred on to this point. It's, and I, like I said last time, sort of like spitting in the wind. It's coming back at you. You're, you're fighting history. And so it says he, he was trembling and he said, Lord, what would you want me to do? And the Lord said to arise and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And so he went on and he was blind for three days. You imagine that? So he had to think, he had a lot to think about, I'm sure. And of course, Ananias um, who was over there, who was a Christian, was uh, had a vision of the Lord, and the Lord told him to go uh, see Saul and baptize him. And of course, uh, Ananias was a little worried about that. And he said, Lord, um, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Hold on to that idea. Uh, God chose him, right? God is going after him. It's a great lesson that he's, he goes after us, but he wanted Saul. Uh, he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, uh, of course, we know he is baptized. The, uh, the scales from, fell from his eyes. And now we come to this. I'm going to read from verse 20 of chapter 9 to uh, verse 25 at this time. And um, let's see. Yeah. Well, I'll just go ahead and read it. We'll just go ahead and read this, right? And I'll explain something else. And it says this, verse 20. <clears throat> Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed 
and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Jerusalem, in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Well, may God bless his reading to his praise. The title of the sermon, I guess the message, the sermon, I, whatever it is, Paul's ministry begins. Paul's ministry begins. Um, it's it's fascinating what what's happened in this man, right? So we he's in one place. He's he's going this way, and he's just as angry as anything. Suddenly, a change. He met Christ. Now, the big question is: when we get here to verse twenty, how is it that he was able to go into the synagogues? and start preaching the Christ after he was thinking one way, and now suddenly he's going the other way. And you'll notice that uh, in verse 20, like it says, he was going into the synagogues. Now, why the synagogues? Uh, that's where all the Jews met. Remember, Jesus told them uh, before he left, he said, you're going to preach this message to the Jew first, uh, Judea. Then you go to the Gentiles. So it goes Samaria, and of course Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. And, uh, and so this is what he did. He saw this. He, These are my people. I'm going to go talk to them. He goes to the synagogues. And uh, we'll, we'll explain a little bit more about that in just a moment, about how he probably went about doing that. But the, but the question is, you know, how did, he, how did he have this knowledge? How did he get there? Now, we know he was inspired by God, right? We know that he, he was inspired to do this. But, uh, you know, how do you... It's sort of like in our election today. Let's say suddenly... Let's, let's just dream a little bit. Let's say Joe Biden is running for president. Suddenly he changes and he becomes a Trump supporter. He says, I'm not running. I'm going to support Trump. And he has all of it. And here was, wait, well, huh? Kamala Harris would be scratching her head, right? And uh, how, why? So, where? You know, that's like strange, right? Well, that's sort of like, I hate to compare Saul to Joe Biden, but you know, that story right here says, how do you go from here to here? Well, we have some answer for that. And if you go over here to Galatians chapter 1, <clears throat> and it, it there's and we get the point here, when we get to Galatians 1 and we read this, it, it tells us, it gives us a little more detail of what happened between 19, verse 19 and verse 20. Uh, <clears throat> this is what it says, pardon me, <clears throat> throat, you know. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. This is what Paul wrote to the Galatians, and he's kind of giving his, his own little history, his own testimony. So he said, um, I make known to you, verse 11, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. In other words, he didn't go to some uh, preacher school to learn Christian preaching. You know, So he says, no, no man gave this to me. So he didn't go to the apostles and say, well, What's give me all the feel? Let's fill in all the details. And then he says here, verse um, 12 For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Christ spoke to him. Now, did it happen in that time when, when he, he knocked him down and, you know, those three days, possibly that the Lord was speaking to him at that time? But he gives us some more detail. He says in verse 13 uh, of Galatians 1, he says, For you have heard of my further conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted uh, the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And then he says, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. So, uh, so he was a zealot. That's like the strongest word you could say for, you know, energetic. He was really in favor, you know, boom. And he said he was, he probably got all A grades, you know. So he, he's, he's, he advanced more than all the other, best student in class. But he says, but when it pleased God, verse 15, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. So he's, he's basically looking back and say, you know, I believe that God called me into this even before I was born. So to reveal his son in me, verse 16, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, 
I did not immediately confirm with flesh and blood. He says, I didn't, go to, I didn't talk to anyone about this. How do you go from here to here, you know? He said, I didn't talk to anyone about it. No one talked to me about it. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem, verse 17, to those who were apostles before me. He says, I didn't go there. I, and the apostles would know everything. I could have gone there and they would have educated, would have, you know, gone to their teaching. He said, but what did he do? I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. That's a big difference. You go, to, you, you go from Damascus, go all the way to Arabia, you know, and he's over there. And how long was he there? Verse 18, he says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. And he goes on and tells more about it. So we get the information here that between, coming back here to Acts chapter 9, that between verse 19 and verse 20, even though it uses this word immediately in verse 20, it, it basically it could mean like immediately time frame or it's like immediately he got right into this preaching. He left there. He left Damascus. He must have been driven in, into the desert, in other words, by, by God. And, he's, and he spent three years in Arabia doing what? He said Jesus revealed this to him. Now, isn't this curious that maybe it was that he had this three-year experience with the Lord, the risen Lord Jesus? Perhaps he brought some scrolls with him, and he had access to the, all the Old Testament scrolls. And then, uh, you know, Jesus kind of guiding him through all of this. I mean, how else are you going to change like that so, so drastically, so dramatically? And so... After he gets all this, and he said he, he's there for three years in Arabia, because why would you go to Arabia? Get away from everybody. You know, we all have to get away. Some of us, uh, where would you do if you want to go to, maybe go to Big Bear, right? Not too many people up there, right? Maybe you go uh, to Barstow, not too hot. <laughs> uh, go to the desert, go to Death Valley or something, right? And you want to just be on your own, and the Lord was with him three years and teaching him. That's basically what he is saying. I didn't get it from any man. No one taught me this. But he said a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's kind of, uh, you know, just induction, thinking about this. Okay, so now he comes back. Now he comes back and we, we rejoin him in, in verse 20. And the first place he goes to is the synagogues. Why the synagogues? They're Jews. He's a Jew. He goes in there. And what do they do? They, they often do this. And, and their services were sort of like Christian services. But one of them would be, anybody want to read a scripture in here? Anybody have any words to say? I do. Can I read something? Remember, they did that with Jesus. Remember, anybody have something to read? Jesus comes up, gives me, give me the scroll from Isaiah, and he reads it. Here, here's Saul. He, he starts to talk. And it says, verse 21, All who, who heard were amazed, and they said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem? And has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. Is this the same person? Who, no. It's sort of like us going back to the Biden. Let's, you know, let's, let's imagine Biden suddenly makes a commercial supporting Trump. And everyone's saying, no, wait a minute. Didn't he? They, why would? Hmm, what? You know, and that's what they're thinking here. Who is this guy? And he says in verse 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. There's a very interesting point. He did his Old Testament study, and he studied it so well that he could just boom, 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 give all the verses so that they're like, this is like the debate, right? We're all talking about a presidential debate. This was the debate. He was over there, and they're raising questions, and he said, no, here's the answer, here's the answer, here's the answer. And he would go and get all of these uh, things from the scriptures, and it says he was confounding them. And they're like, uh, so what do they do? Well, if you, always, if you lose the argument in a debate, you could do one or two things. Today, they just smear the person, right? If you lose a debate, now what they do is that they say terrible things about you. Well, you're ugly, you know. <laughs> you know, if they, you, you already know. And you know, by the way, whenever uh, one side loses the argument, if they say you're like Hitler, they've lost the argument. <laughs> they've lost the argument entirely because, because they're saying we, they have nothing else they can bring up. Well, 
their ways of doing things was the same thing that they did for Jesus. They lose the argument, let's kill him. I got an idea, let's go kill him. <laughs> that, yeah, you know, we lose the argument, hey, let's kill him. So that's what they wanted to do. So they plotted to kill him. And by the way, if you'll notice here, verse 23, it says, the Jew, that's the one, T-H-E, and then Jews and a capital J. <clears throat> Whenever you read that, uh, it's, it's important to remember that they're, he's referring to a particular group of Jews, probably, most likely, the leaders. So they would say the Jews. And he's probably not talking about the, the, the members of the congregation over there, all of them, but it's probably their leadership. So whenever you see it, they call it the... Uh, the, the definite article in the Greek. It's the idea of, you know, you're talking about their leadership. So their leadership, I guess they learned a lot of things from the leadership in Jerusalem that they want to kill him. And so verse 24, <coughs> <coughs> their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So they were going to jump him, right, and kill him. So now he has disciples. There are Christians there. Verse 25, they took him by night and they let him down through the wall in a large basket. And, you know, what a way to come, right? He says, okay, bye. <laughs> so, see you later, guys. They roll, put him down in the basket. He gets down. And remember, we talk about the, the cities all had walls around them. So, this is how he'd get out. So, they sneaked him out, put him in a basket and put him down. I bet he thought, man, I came here to kill people. Now, uh, you know, they're, gonna, they're, they're secretly sending me out so that's so we're talking about like a, a this this period where he is over there three years he, he goes off to arabia and then he comes back to damascus uh, but anyway now what happens verse 26 <clears throat> when saul comes to jerusalem verse 26 uh, he tried to join the disciples but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was the disciple you know Hi, I like the place membership. Ooh, where'd everyone go? <laughs> no one wants to talk. Wait a minute, that's Saul. Do, wait, oh, are you packing? Oh no, he doesn't have a gun back. They didn't invent a gun. You have a knife or something like that? No. So uh, they're all scared. And it took one person to do something about this. And his name was Barnabas, verse 27. Uh, now Barnabas is the guy you'll read more about him. He's He's going to be Paul's buddy for a while, and uh, he's going to help him out. And he was, this is the man who gave the property and such. But Barnabas, the, his name means encouragement. And there was just something about this man's character. Uh, he, he was, you know, he wasn't a hard liner. He was just this person who was friendly to everybody. It, I just get that impression. And he was the guy who would just, you know, wrap his arm around and say, hey, come on, brother. And, and introduce him when everyone's afraid. And so he takes Paul, or Saul, I keep saying that, and brought him into the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. How did he know that? Because Saul must have, they must have had a talk, you know, so he must have took him. So what are you doing here, Saul? Uh, aren't you trying to see, everyone's kind of scared of you. Now what's this, you seem like a happy person now. Well, I'll tell you what happened. You know, I was on the way to Damascus. I wanted to kill all these people and or get them to jail, but the Lord met me on the road. He, oh, he did, huh? And so they're having this. And so he must have explained all of this to him. So in verse 27, he uh, uh, Barnabas tells how, you know, he met the Lord on the road, uh, verse 27, and that he had spoken to him and how he preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he must have received this information from Saul and maybe some other people who told him about it. And uh, so I'm sure the other apostles were like, whoa, uh, can we trust this guy? Uh, but notice that. Uh, so he was with them at Jerusalem and got to the point they accepted him. And it says, in coming in and going out. In other words, he was able to go in and out with him. He didn't have to hide or anything like that. And it was a great thing. So we can be thankful for a man like Barnabas. It's a good idea, you know, if we need more Barnabases, if you could uh, put it that way, in our fellowships. We need people who are uh, going out there and bringing the visitor in, or the visitor doesn't feel comfortable with people, and other people look at them like, oh, you know, this is a kind of a strange person. You need a Barnabas-type person. 
It could be a man or a woman or both, you know, just to welcome this person in. I accept you and bring you in. So we need more people like that. And that's what he did in the church. So it came to the point where now, as I said, verse 28, uh, the apostles accept him. He's their friend and he's able to go in and go out. And it says here in verse 29, he spoke boldly in the name of Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, uh, but they attempted to kill him. Everyone wants to kill him. But notice uh, this word boldly, he had courage. That's, he, it doesn't mean that he got up there and yelled at people. Or he was able to be very courageous in sharing the gospel with these other people. And it was in the name of the Lord Jesus. By the way, back in verse 20, he refers to Jesus as the Son of God. That probably got a lot of Jews upset at him, right? But over here, he says it's the Hellenists who wanted to, who are the Hellenists? Now, these were the Greek-speaking Jews, the Jews who had been kind of educated in the Greek tradition. They may have come from other places where, um, you know, of the of the area where they were educated. It was the Greek-speaking Jews, um, or the Hellenists, if you will, who came after Stephen. They're the ones who, you know, they were hardcore people. And we're going to read more about these individuals that they will come after. They're, they're, gonna, they're going to hunt uh, Saul down to his ending days. They're, they will not let go. And so uh, it says that he disputed with them. And he was a, and when we hear the word disputed, we're going to read more about this later where he actually is reasoning with them. Uh, you'll see this in other places. Saul reasoned with, or Paul, he's reasoning with other people. He's going to scripture. He's not calling them names and he's not, just not quoting things. He was saying, well, let's look it up. Let's look it up. And that's the way it is in Bible study. Let's look it up. It's not a matter of my uh, opinion versus your opinion. Let's see what the Bible says. And that's pretty much what he was doing. But he was getting these people upset because they're saying, you're, you're messing around with our tradition. You're messing around with what we believed in, what we know. You're asking us to do something that we would never have done, and that is to give up what we've done, you know, give up our, our animal sacrifice. You, you want us to do that? People are like that today. There are lots of people like that. They come to the point where they see the truth in the scripture, but they can't bring themselves to make the change because it means that they're having to give up something. They may have to break with their family. The family may yell at them, call them names and stuff like that. They may have to break up with certain you know, habits that they have or something. And so uh, instead of welcoming Saul and saying, you know, thank you so much for educating us on that, they said, hmm, let's kill him. <laughs> yeah, I'm the one trick pony. <laughs> Is that the only thing you can do, just kill someone? So when the brethren found out, uh, <laughs> here they come, the Christians, they come to the rescue. They found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus. So here was... You know, they, first of all, Damascus, they sent him down by a basket. Here, Paul is out there teaching and everyone, and he's probably feeling good about himself. And everyone wants to kill him, and they say, come on, uh, let's get out of town. You know, we don't want to die. So they, they, they secretly send him out, and they go to Tarsus. So he's going to be there for quite a while. I'm, and I'm sure he's, he's going to be just languishing over there. I'm sure he's going to be there, like, thinking, well, what do I have to do? What's... You know, Lord has changed me. I have, uh, I've converted, and now what? And he's going to be, he's going to be sitting there stewing. I'm sure, in uh, in Tarsus until he is called again by guess who, Barnabas. Okay, but we'll we'll get to that later. Verse 31, it says the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. Why? Saul's off the off the radar now. Saul's no longer out there trying to kill people, and uh, apparently the other Jews don't have an organized resistance yet to, to go after him. So the churches are are flourishing. They're happy. All is well throughout Judea, Galilee, the northern part, Samaria that we've read about earlier, in the far northern part, and um, everyone was walking in the fear of the Lord. In other words, that they were they were worshiping God. And they had the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Spirit comforts us in the church. That's what the Spirit does, part of the, the comfort, the fellowship of the Lord in the church. And it says, and they multiplied. So the church was growing. So remember, 2,000, 5,000, multiple 
by this time, how many thousands and thousands of Christians are there uh, are going around and everyone's happy now. Everything's at peace. Wow. Great story, but I'm going to close it right here and we'll pick up next time. And uh, we'll, we're still in chapter 9, so we're going to see something about uh, Peter and then we're going to go on a little bit further. Uh, you'll, uh, we'll see the story of Peter. So something to keep in mind, uh, the book of Acts is the, it's the activity of the Holy Spirit in the church, right? And we see the Holy Spirit acting, or the, the book of Acts, primarily with two main characters in it. One is Peter, who, uh, you know, along with the other apostles, but Peter is the spokesperson. He's, he's kind of the star of the first half of Acts. And then the second half is Saul, becoming Paul. He has the second part of it. So it's like a, a two-part story. So here's Peter, and he does his thing, and then he kind of fades out into the background, and then you have uh, Paul. So we'll see more about this later. So in the meantime, we'll close this up, and I'm glad you're you're able to say, I hope. And, I, and as I said before, I'm reading from the uh, New King James translation, but... <clears throat> If you have a different translation, that's fine. You know, living translation or something like this. Be, as long as we're able to study together, right? And we'll, we'll learn a lot more. So I'm going to put this aside. And uh, we're going to sing. And uh, we have more people. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention. We have our guests. We have our, our, uh, our gallery of our regulars. And we have other people. We have doubled. We have multiplied. Okay, so first of all, we have Mary. Okay, ready? And we have Cindy. And we have Judy. Judy's here, right? Right? Okay. okay. <laughs> we have Laura. And we have Linda. And we have Ruth and Ashki. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, so here we are, right? So uh, we're so we're having a good time over here studying God's word. I hope you're having a good time. We try to have a good time. We study God's word. It's you know it's time to be happy and joyful, and and we're reading something great. So we are in this book, and it is uh, we're going to be reading or oh, singing. Um, this world is not my home. And I'm going to check if you have this book. Oh, I'm sorry, 684 in, in this songbook, 684. <clears throat> and in this book here, if you happen to have it, uh, this is, hold on, this is the, it's all, don't go anywhere, just stay right there. This, this, no, what, okay, this oh yeah, uh, 526, 526 in this book. So if you have this book, it's 526. And if you have this book, it's 684. So get ready. And we will see. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior's pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. 
Just up in glory land will live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That's an old one, huh? That's a great song. That's a fun one to you. I don't know if anyone was tapping their toes in there, but I won't take, I won't check, okay? It's a toe tapper, though, right? Okay, now we're going to advance to uh, taking the Lord's Supper. And, of course, I know that uh, some of you may have the that two-cup method. We have that as well. And, oh, I do need to let you know that if you are seeking uh, more supplies uh, for taking the Lord's Supper at home, you can always come by here on Sunday uh, or uh, give Robert a call. Give us a call, and we'll have that, that ready for you. In the meantime, we have this, and I would remind you that when we do do it, you, you, there's like a little th thing at the top. You pull this off. Well, I'll show you how to just make it. Then for the for the bread and then for this. But what I'm going to do is uh, we'll we'll have a prayer for both. Uh, we'll have one prayer for both the uh, the elements of the Lord's Supper. So we'll pray together and then we'll take this. <clears throat> our our gracious heavenly Father, um, we honor you. We thank you, God. You have uh, you've been marvelous. You're a wonderful God and. And as we uh, have read about the Apostle Paul or the soon-to-be Apostle Paul in this great story of his conversion, that to think that in his case, and I'm sure in ours, that you knew us before we were born. You knew everything about us. And, and as Paul said, he was separated from his mother's womb. There was that time that he was chosen and you looked for him. And he had to go through all these tough things uh, in his I guess his prejudice, and then finally uh, he just turned around so quickly because of the power of your word, power of your spirit, and the confrontation with Christ. What a wonderful blessing. And God, is all because of your son dying on the cross. We know that there's a power that comes from that death, not only the forgiveness of sins, which is wonderful in itself, God, but also the change of life and the change of perspective the, the 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 home as the the song that we've said we, I can't I can't live in this world much longer I, anymore I want to be with you it's that yearning that you've given to us through Jesus's uh, death and burial and resurrection so God as we take this cup first of all we take the bread that represents the body that was just so beaten and bruised and torn up for us and as your word tells us by his stripes we are healed. It's a healing aspect, not for him. It was for us, and uh, he was just so brutally treated. And so the, the bread that represents that, we will take. And then after that, Father, we pray you'll bless this time as we take the cup, which represents the blood of Christ that was shed upon the cross for us. So we do this now. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Okay. I'm going to take the, uh, the bread. We just kind of peel this off from the top. And... It gets a little hard at times. I will I'll take this. Hope you can get. There's like this little plastic. There you go. The, the body of Christ. And now, the uh, blood of Christ. Very much a moment of serenity and, and thought of what the Lord has done for us, and um, we're glad that we could do this. Of course, I know once again there are some have asked, well, what about, uh, are you doing this twice? And as we've said before, this will probably, this, this part of, the, of our activity will be probably run first. You'll see this first on Sunday, and then our actual worship 
you'll probably see later on Sunday. In some cases, I think they've come on late Sunday night. So this gives you an opportunity to take advantage of that. But if you take it twice, there's no harm. There's no harm. <laughs> Nothing bad about it. It's, it's good for us. Uh, we would remind you, though, um, and you've all been very generous, um, we would remind you that if you, uh, about the contributions. Oh, we haven't had any contributions in two weeks? Is that what? Okay. I've just been advised we haven't had any contributions in two weeks. Okay. So if you, if you would, and we, you know, this is not, of course, I'm not selling it or anything or anything like that. But if you would be so kind as to uh, send your contributions in, you can mail it to us. And, of course, we have our P.O. box that we will show. <laughs> at the close of this and uh, if you can send do that or drop it off here and of course because every just because we have the COVID thing um, doesn't mean everything stops and you know it's, it's sort of like that in the community uh, they have this moratorium on on rents but it, it, it doesn't mean that the rent has stopped it just means that you may not have to pay it for a while but when they come back on you're still having to owe the money well Nothing stops for us that we still have the electricity, we still have the insurance, which is through the roof. You wouldn't believe our insurance bill that we have to pay and all these other things. So encourage you to send your, uh, and taxes too. You wouldn't believe our tax. <laughs> Why don't we just move the whole church building, go out of state or something, <laughs> yeah, you know, where it's cheaper. Okay, so all these, all, all these crazy things. So those are the material things. And if you could send that in, we'd be very grateful. Um, and I think that's about it, right? We're going, we're going to, uh, of course, we encourage you to watch our, uh, our Sunday morning service. And we also want to encourage you to keep praying for the congregation. Pray that, um, you know, pray for the governor, you know, to change his mind about things. And it just seems like, um, you know, some things are still like the, the churches are closed. Why? You know, we, we, we have medical needs, we have physical needs, we, we have spiritual needs. And there's, there are many people who need this spiritual time of fellowship uh, with their brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, um, and it's so easy. People are getting depressed, people are getting down because of this. And so pray that they will um, open up the congregations throughout California and around the country so God's people can come back together again. Well, as always, should we sing that song like we did last time? The, uh... No. No. <laughs> I'll read this thing from Numbers chapter 6. For some reason, that didn't go over well. Okay. Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Heavenly Father, we honor you. We thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this time together. Thank you that everyone is here. Um, uh, you know, we've got more people in the room, and that's great. Thank you, God, for your wonderful word. And uh, what a great story to hear about the Apostle Paul. Is the beginning of his great ministry. Uh, God, we know that the world is topsy-turvy. Lots of crazy things out there that are happening, things that are scary, things that, um, that kind of get us angry and frustrated, um, and all of this stuff, whether it's politics or the crime that's in the street and all these awful things. But God, we need the strength personally to be able to weather these things. We know that this world is passing away. We know this too shall pass, all of this stuff. And one day we'll be able to be with thee in heaven. But we know that in the meantime, as your word tells us, as Jesus told his disciples, and he tells us, I'll never leave you. I will be with you always. And we pray, God, that we'll always have that sense of that reality of that, that your son is with us, that your spirit is with us, that, the, that everything is for real and that it's uh, strong from God's word. So guide us, Father, throughout this coming week. May this be a great week of service to you. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. We'll see you next time.